We'll open the subcommittee hearing on HB 127 FN. The three out of the four regular subcommittee members are here, Ginsburg, Lord Mantos, and the chairman, Chairman Swinford, appointed Representative Villeneuve to be on the subcommittee today. So we have four members present. We're pretty informal here in the subcommittee, so I'll invite people from the audience to speak uh, and share with us their opinions and insight on this bill. Basically what happens one, when we started out earlier in the year, 127, there was 127 and 145, both had to do with audio recording, uh, the audio, re audio recording and eavesdropping statute. So we had had uh, these bills to update it and look at that. And since, since we heard it early in the year, we've had, there have been some things that have happened in the news that are, um, that have shed more light on this and perhaps change our way we look at this. One is there have been a couple more people arrested out of where for um, audio recording police officers are being stopped. Another thing was a recent first, tell me a first district court? First circuit. First circuit court. First circuit. Yeah. Which is first the last circuit. court before the Supreme Court, right? Yes. Last, okay, it's a federal court of appeals. Uh, but it just happened to be in Massachusetts. So I think New Hampshire, you, know, you as attorneys are nodding. In New Hampshire, it would be sort of covered under that first district. We're part of the same geographical area, I guess. I think it was called the Glick decision, G-L-I-K. And the summary there was that this gentleman Glick was in the Boston Common. He heard some shouting, and uh, I guess he saw some somebody being arrested. And he turned on his cell phone, and audio, video and audio recorded the uh, altercation or the arrest. Then a police officer came over and told him to shut off his camera. And he said no. And they arrested him. And Rest on initially three different charges. One was the, the eavesdropping statute, one was disorderly conduct, I think, one was you know, they just do stuff against the wall to uh, make it stick. Two of which they later dropped, they were kind of silly charges. I have a copy of the opinion here. Obstruction. Obstructing police officer. Obstructing police officer. Yeah. I mean, even the guy was standing 10 feet away. Dis disturbing the peace and aiding in the escape of a prisoner. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of a stretch, and we've seen similar uh, charges here in uh, New Hampshire for people uh, on simple traffic stops. In fact, one of the problems has been that in some cases, the prosecutors are charging felony wiretapping charges to on for drivers who are recording their own um, traffic stop. All right. Sometimes they drop it to misdemeanor, but still it's, it's clogging up the court. So that's where we are kind of right now. And these two, we had these bills, even though they had different approaches to changing the statute, uh, we, the committee held on to 127, retained it, and they pushed forward 145, HB 145, which passed the House, went over to the Senate, and I think it was the Judiciary Committee over there, they retained it, and looked at it over the summer, and Fenton Gruen made some changes to it, Anyway, they ended up voting in just last month to re-retain it. So it's sort of stalled over there for now, until next year. So we have a chance now to look at 127 and uh, maybe merge two, or maybe just uh, look at 127 as own merit and you know, and judge on do that on its own. So anyway, I'd like to invite uh, commentary from the public. Thank you, uh, Attorney Hippel. Thank you. All right. Copies of circuit. the uh, First Circuit panel because I thought that may come up, and it's always nice to be able to actually read directly from the opinion. I also brought um, mm -hmm. copies. I'm just going to pass these. Yeah, come on back. We're in the um, today. I um, also brought copies of uh, testimony I made before the Senate. Um, I didn't update it. It's exactly what I uh, said to the Senate, but I thought it might be helpful uh, for the House members. I would like to address a few things uh, that Missy Bell said. Uh, first of all, regarding the um, First Circuit opinion, it was not an interpretation of federal law. It's true that federal law is a one-party consent law. Um, it was actually an interpretation. It was actually not an interpretation of any law. It was an 
except the Constitution, it stated it doesn't matter what the law says, it doesn't matter that Massachusetts has a two-party consent state, that's irrelevant. The fact is, is that the First Amendment overrides Massachusetts's two-party consent state and it allows people to record their public officials in public. And that was what the ruling actually said. And does that automatically apply here now? Yes, uh, the First Circuit uh, covers uh, Maine, I'm sorry, I believe it's Maine, uh, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island, I believe. So it wouldn't apply to California? Um, well, law. the law would be persuasive. It would be a persuasive ruling in California. Um, other ruling, the 11th Circuit, uh, I believe, if you look at actually my Senate testimony, I cite a few cases. The First Circuit is not the first court to say this is uh, well established. In fact, this opinion, that the uh, Glick opinion, is not the first time the First Circuit has said this. About 10 years ago, uh, the First Circuit said the same thing. Um, and a very curt opinion basically said, no, this isn't a crime. The First Amendment protects it. And what was happening in the Glick opinion was um, the city of Boston was being sued by a gentleman who was arrested and charged with wiretapping, and they later, it was later dismissed. And um, the city of Boston was basically, it was claiming qualified immunity basically saying, we didn't know that this was illegal. Maybe we shouldn't have arrested him, but we didn't know that arresting him and charging him with this wiretapping law was a violation of his rights, so we should have qualified immunity. And, this, and the uh, circuit court basically said, no, you should have known 10 years ago that this was, this was not allowed to be happening. And the fact that you still did it even after we told you not to 10 years ago means you have to pay money for it. Um, that's basically in, in the um, lack of qualified immunity basically means you pay money to the person you harmed. So. I'd, I'd like more clarification on how First Circuit Court rulings apply to state law here. So it said that one that uh, the two-party notification is not appropriate or applicable if it's in public? Well, yeah, and here's, here's another thing that I wanted to cover regarding uh, Mrs. Bell's uh, testimony, which I always enjoy. She always has a very good perspective to bring. But I think that what we have to remember is we often skip over the first part of the wiretapping statute. Yes, the wiretapping statute does say that in some situations you have to notify both parties. But before the notification requirement comes into play, the person has to have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Because the definition of oral communication in the law says it's communication uttered by a person with an expectation that such communication is not subject to interception, interception under circumstances justifying such expectation. That is basically, word for word, the reasonable expectation of privacy as we use it in, in, um, in our, in, often in criminal practice, Fourth Amendment practice. So you don't have to notify everybody. Only people that are exhibiting a reasonable expectation that they're not subject to interception. That, give, that right there gives, gives us the um, the uh, ability to, we're talking about all these different situations. What about this situation? What about that situation? The reasonable expectation of privacy is flexible. And that's both the beauty of it and the problem with it. Because it's hard to define, but that's also a benefit in some situations. But what we have now is obviously, obviously, to, to me, this can, nothing can be more obvious than the fact that a public employee in a public place public duties on the public payroll do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. But unfortunately, that's something that some police departments disagree with. And that's why we're here today, because as uh, Ms. Garrett mentioned, we've had uh, 10 to 12 arrests in the last four to five years, Ms. Garrett being one of them. When you uh, uh, state that as a public official, mm -hmm. do you have in the back of your mind a distinction between a police officer and a clerk in the welfare department? Well, when I say, I mean, a, pub, a public official in a public place, I think at the very least we can all agree that we're talking police officers, firefighters, um, other people working for the government in public, on public streets. Um, recording them is not wiretapping. So um, a public a, place would be the distinction between uh, an official like that and an official in an office. State Department. I actually think that this decision has already been made. We spent a lot of time, at least it seems to me that there's a lot of time spent saying, well, what about the people in the welfare offices? What about the, you know, the Attorney General meeting with the victim in a, in a case? These decisions have already been made. The Attorney General already said, uh, and if, it's in my written testimony that I handed you, that um, 
the, uh, I believe it was the county attorney's office on the seacoast, did not have, he actually reported his employees behind the walls of their offices. They were in their cubicles. Reportsman, thank you, reportsman, said that uh, there was no reasonable expectation of privacy. But that's what the attorney general said. This, this is already this decision has already been made. That there is no reasonable expectation there. No, because it's a public employee performing a public duty. Do you think there should be? No. No, because uh, I think I don't see how you have any, uh, an open democratic republic when people aren't able to know that when when what a public official does is private. And to me, it's contradictory. I mean, the right to know law says that everything that they do, we have a right to get a copy of it. So how can it be private if the right to know law says that we're able to actually go in and get copies of it? You wouldn't make a distinction between what they do in the course of their duties on paper or what they're saying to each other in the course of Well, if it's on a, their they're, if they're on a lunch break, if they go out and have lunch somewhere and they're still in their uniforms, obviously that's not a public function. If they have lunch in the office, though, I mean, you know, is there any way to make a distinction there between recording them and having access to the documentation that they produce? I would have to think about that. Yeah. It would be a difficult yeah. distinction to make. That's why but, I asked you. Right. Yeah, and, and, but the problem really to me is not, uh, I haven't seen an issue with people, with government officials being recorded in a way that, you know, is somewhat, somewhat, somehow outrageous. I haven't seen that problem. The problem I have seen is people getting charged with felonies. Um, for recording police officers. And then what usually happens is that the camera is seized, the footage is erased, and then once the charges are dropped, they return an empty camera to the person, which I think is not One nice. of the uh, sticky points here in, in 145 is this phrase, any public official. Mm -hmm. uh, the data that is very, uh, did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, that's great. Uh, just mentioned, I think applies to police officers and stops in public places. Um, this, any public official, would significantly broaden uh, the scope of this I situation. Just, I don't think that saying any public official would broaden what we already have, because what we already have is the reasonable expectation of privacy language, and any public official is already accepted. In my opinion, the law already states what, it already states what we want it to state. It's just that there's certain people who don't seem to get it, and they need a little bit of clarification. Are any of the people that you think don't seem to get it other than police officers, police departments? There, are, most police departments do get it. It's a, it's a select few police departments that insist that they 10 or 12 or 4 years. Yeah, it's not a huge number. Uh, but do you think it, there are other situations in which there are public officials who don't get it and need to be informed of it? Um, possibly. Kind of well, well, here's the thing. Let's let's say that you um, passed passed a bill that said um, that passed an exception for police officers. You don't have to notify police officers. What that does is it, 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 there's an implication from that that I think would be harmful. I actually think that that would be a worse. I think the law would be worse after that bill was passed than before. Because if what you confine it to police officers rather than just any public official. Yes, because right now you're able to report any public official in public. I mean, we can talk about the, the, the gray areas, you know, in the back offices and lunchrooms and such, but in public, you can record any public official while they're exercising their public duties. And to Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt, but sure. does in public include their performance in their office? I think it does. Okay. But the, the issue I'm trying to zero in on right now yeah. is, if you say there's an exception for police officers, you can record police officers as long as you notify them. If you pass that, there's an implication there that it only applies to police officers. And therefore, we take a law that already allows people to report their public officials in public, whether they be um, you know, police officers or firefighters or whatever, and you now have an implication that firefighters are exempt. And I actually have something in page two of my written testimony, uh, just a situation that I thought of. Imagine a WMUR reporter with a 10-foot boom microphone standing um, you know, across the street from a group of firefighters and fighting the fire. Under the, the bill that's passed by the House, he would be committing a felony because he's not going to go up to every firefighter and inform them that he's recorded because they're busy. But they are in public. They don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. He wouldn't be committing a, a felony under the law as it is now. But I think that under, after you pass this bill, you create a gray area where he could be committing a felony because they're not police officers and he's not notified. 145 doesn't say anything about notification. Um, 
My understanding is it's distinct, I think, from the notification requirements of the wiretapping. It permits recording, and it doesn't say nothing about it. I may be, I, I don't have a copy of the bill in front of me, and I may be remembering in Yeah, because 145 says yeah. the person making the recording shall first take notification of the recording to the officer. And the no, one. Not, not in the first one. This is the amendment to pass the House. Okay. Mr. Olson, do you want to chime in on this? Oh, yes. In answer to their representative's question about other people, not police officers. I live in the town in Grafton, and we've had our town clerk eject people from her office for refusing to turn off a camera. We've had people go into the office to record their own interactions with the town clerk, and she's refused to interact with them. She's ejected them on occasion, and at least once she threatened to call the police on them. And she's now put up a sign in the office claiming that it's illegal under a privacy act. I forget what citation it was, but under some privacy act to record DMV town clerk type business in her office. That's not a private office. That's it, the this, is the, this is the town clerk's office. The, yes. the counter that you walk up to. Okay. So th there are people in addition to police officers that have been doing this. Great. I have one more clarification. I'm sorry, go ahead. Senator Mulroney. One thing that needs to be, when you talk about any public official, you're also talking about individuals engaged in adoptions individuals engaged in contagious diseases, individuals engaged in administering medication, individuals engaged in financial affairs of individuals. All of those are also private by law, and you have an expectation of privacy of my financial affairs, how I'm going to, my, my patient to, uh, uh, doctor patient privacy for a medical condition that I may have. And if you say all public officials, well, the public health nurse can now be recorded in her office. And if you take it to the logical extreme, well, she's doing an exam. That's, that's not true. That's and not here's, true. Here's why. Two things. One, um, adoptions are already covered specifically in the law. The, um, it, it says that uh, adoption proceedings are closed to the public. Um, and yeah, uh, the court can't be recorded without, if, uh, if I might. Recorded without the judge's permission. When you put something in now, it supersedes everything before it. No, the law doesn't work like a chronology. It works. The, the, the courts will view it as one cohesive whole and try to uh, interpret all the laws um, consistent with each other. So if the law says public officials do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy while performing their public duties, it will take that and it will supersede the other laws, such as the adoption proceedings. It's not going to repeal the other law, but the court will look at it as a whole. Well, could we um, just simply put in this text as something like, unless otherwise exempted by law? Exactly. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, that would nest be, be required. Okay. And I, I, I would also mention that the, um, when it comes to the, um, I'm trying to remember what it was, there was the adoption and there was another another situation that was mentioned. Oh, the, the health worker during an exam. This was also brought up in the Senate testimony when the Attorney General's office said, well, what if I'm in my office and I'm, report, and I'm uh, interviewing a victim? Can that conversation be recorded? The answer is no, because the victim or the private citizen who's being uh, interviewed has their own reasonable expectation of privacy. So their voice is still protected by the, uh, by the wiretapping law, assuming that they're not in a public place. And, uh, assuming that they're exhibiting a reasonable expectation of privacy. So it doesn't allow recording of anything that a public official touches at any time because the non-public officials, they still have that reasonable expectation of privacy. I have a question for you about the Glick decision, First, court, first uh, Circuit. Does that decision only apply to police officers or public officials? Uh, the, law, the, 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 the case actually um, says public officials. Um, it doesn't say police officers. And it, it's interesting, it also makes the exception, that it's under the First Amendment right to freedom of the press, but it explicitly says it doesn't only apply to reporters. So it's a very broad ruling. Um, and the, the tone of the ruling, I think when you read it, I think you'll find that the court finds this to be almost so obvious that they can't believe that they're dealing with this. Um, that's the tone that I get from the ruling, is that 
the courts will be surprised if they have to say this. Thank you. Do you still feel that the state should do something about the current law? Will it help for taxpayer people like Trump and maybe rest again if we change this? It really depends on how you do it. But at this point, I mean, it, it's almost as if the courts have um, bypassed the legislature on this. Um, Bypass meaning that they fix, they, they begin, begin to fix the problem before the legislature has finished its business. I'm concerned about passing a bill that actually adds uh, restrictions to a First Amendment right, and then we have to litigate it more to have the court not down those restrictions. I'm concerned about passing a bill that says this only applies to police officers, and it only applies if you inform them, and you know, all the other various things that I mean, Simon Glick did not inform the police officers that he was reporting, and it was still covered by the First Amendment. Um, he still was had the right to do it. Um, and the, the Glick decision mentions, as you said, public officials, not just police officers. So if you pass a bill that runs afoul of this Glick decision and says, well, it's only police officers and only if you inform them, we're, we're back where we were. Where yes, it's still legal because the First Amendment still overrides New Hampshire law, but. Now we have this confusion. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? People will be forced to litigate. Exactly, and that costs money and it takes time. So that's my concern. If, if we can pass a bill, and uh, in my written testimony, I have a, a very simple suggestion, just saying in the definition of oral communication that public employees do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in how they perform their public duties, I think that's fine. Um, I think that that would clarify the law sufficiently whether or not it's necessary is, is becoming unclear. What I am concerned about, more than you passing nothing, I am more concerned at this point about you passing a bill that adds restrictions that will only further complicate the issue. Yeah, that's a good point. You need to avoid that. My uh, contact information is on there if you need that, if you have any further questions for your time. Thank you. Uh, anybody else from the public wish to be heard on this topic? That's Bill? I would just weigh in. Yeah, Bill. Uh, Mr. Uh, Bill Finnecoe from Manchester. I would just weigh in that uh, I followed uh, several of these uh, wiretapping cases that have taken place in, in the last year. Uh, uh, in a nutshell, I'd say on the job, on the record, if you are a public servant, i.e., if you are employed by the government, then anything that you do during the course of your workday should be able to be recorded by anybody who's interacting with you without any notification. With regard to uh, Carla uh, throwing out the number of 10 to 14 cases over the last four years, that sounds like a low number and not too concerning. But if you look at the curve of those numbers, this is increasing at a rapid rate. Five of the, at least five of those cases, or six of those cases, are within the last year or 14, 16 months. And they're only going to increase further as more and more people have interactions with semi-rogue police that think that they can make the laws up as they go along, and more and more people are recording, that number is going to spiral out of control. The other thing that I find completely disturbing is that they will arrest you for wiretapping. You have a year of wait before you get your day in court. You have to hire an attorney. You have expenses. You have the fear of what's going to happen to you. You have it hanging over your head. And then the day you appear in court, it's thrown out. It's dismissed. You never even get to see the judge. This is baloney. And sometimes they take your camera, don't they? Yeah. Oh, and they, they take your equipment. They take your camera for several months. Absolutely. So these, are, these are the things that I'm quite concerned with. And, and as I say, I've, I've followed at least five cases very closely. And uh, this is not acceptable. It's got to stop. I don't, I don't like any law where police can take you and have you arrested, hold you one night over a weekend if you're unfortunate to be arrested on a Friday night, and, uh, and the end result is that the charges are dropped. Where's the payback to the, to the citizen for being held in jail? Where's the payback to the citizen for being handcuffed to a pole in the police station? over a, a law that's misapplied. They shouldn't be able to uh, arrest people for, for filming. That's, that's my opinion. It's got to stop. Whatever, whatever language you have to put in. Thank you. 
Representative Lambert, do you have something else you want to share? On? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I know you've heard a lot of testimony, and this is a complex topic. I'm often disappointed because when I was young, I was an ideal, you know, I idealized being an American because I was under the impression from everything they told me when I was in school that I had a right to freedom. They kept telling me that. They made me take tests on this idea that I had all of this protection, and they told me it is better that 10 guilty men go free than one innocent man goes to jail. And yet today, the people who have the ability to walk up to my car, put handcuffs on me and drag me out of my car because I recorded them, get to be judge and jury on whether or not I'm spending the next hour in jail. Not whether or not it's adjudicated in a court, or any of that, they get to drag me out first without due process. It scares me. We talk about 12 incidents, they don't seem like a big deal. We have a 1.3 million person population. Why do we care about 12 people? Like you hear on these people over here say, I care that those people, when they're on the job, means they're on the record. I came up with that slogan because a friend of mine, his mother called me up and said, I, I have to get a lawyer and I need $10,000 to save my son because he reached up to his dashboard and pressed the record button on a recorder because he's got Asperger's syndrome and he didn't want to forget any of the detail for his mother. And they charged him with wiretapping. He spent the next year of his life in torture. He was going to prison. That is not my America. That's not why they told me I'm supposed to have the rights. And it scares me when doing the research for that, that police officers, through their unions, are told, if you end up in a situation where there's recording, charge the individual, take the recording, it becomes evidence in a criminal trial, and anything you did wrong isn't coming out. That's not the fairness that I got up here advocating for for the last few years. Those 12 people who spent five, ten, twenty thousand dollars on a legal retainer still don't get to sleep better at night and when the courts, because of ambiguity here, dismiss the charge or because prosecutors dismiss the charge, those people never get a single night of sleep back. It's our job to protect the citizens now not to study this for years. It has been too many years already. Thank you for your time. Please, let's protect our citizens so this doesn't happen again. Thank you very much. So what's the pleasure of the committee? Do you have to uh, see if we can work?